Good evening, everyone. How are you? Thank you so much for being here at the Wellfleet Public Library. My name is Gabrielle Griffiths. I work as the outreach coordinator here. Very excited to be introducing our poets tonight. Um, before we begin, if you could please turn off your cellular device. Thank you so much. Um, and can you all hear me okay? Is the audio awesome? All right, so I'm going to introduce all three of our poets just to start, and then they're all going to read for about 15 minutes each. Um, I'm going to read them, read the bios in reverse order from how they're going to read. So we will be beginning with James, Mitch, and then Martin. Um, but I'm going to introduce Martin first, and then Mitch, and then James. So, um, all right, to begin, um, Martin Edmonds chapbook, Black Ops was published by Aerosmith Press in 2018. His book, The High Road to Taos, won the National Poetry Series. Work has appeared in The New Yorker, A Public Space, The Paris Review, Little Star, The Nation, The Par Partisan Review, Southwest Review, and Agony, and is featured on the Yates Society of New York website. Honors include an artist fellowship from the Massachusetts Cultural Council, the Discovery, the National Prize, and the Lloyd McKim Garrison Medal for Poetry. Filmwork includes co-writing the screenplay for the feature Passion in the Desert and adapting Calderon de la Barca's play Life is a Dream. Our second poet, Mitch Manning, is the author of City of Water, which was also published by Aerosmith Press. Um, he's taught poetry in central China and his poems have been read in Basra, southern Iraq as part of the Boston to Basra project. He teaches in the English and Labor Studies program at UMass Boston and is associate director at the Joyner Institute for the Study of War and Social Consequences. He's an associate editor for Consequence magazine and founder of No Infinite, a journal of poetry, art, and protest. Poems and interviews published in the Doris, Boog City, Let the Bucket Down, Consequence, Sundial, Hollow, Gaff, and more. And for our last poet, James Stotts was born in 1982, the last of five children in Southern Colorado, and grew up in New Mexico. He studied Russian literature and linguistics at the University of New Mexico, was a research assistant in Russian, Russian at Boston College, and has translated many Russian poets whose names I cannot pronounce. I tried. It, it went badly. Um, he has traveled and studied in Russia on numerous occasions. He lives in Boston with his wife and son. His work has appeared in Little Star, Agony, The Atlantic, and Fail Better. Penn and Anvil Press reissued his first book since, since in 2016 and will publish Elgin Pelicans, his second in August. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our first poet, James Stotts. Cool, thank you very much. Um, I do have copies of the book. I got advanced copies from my publisher for this reading. Um, and I'll read, um, the first poem in the book is a, is a loose translation of Osip Mandelstam, and thank you, and and it also informs the title poem, which doesn't have a title, but the first line is um, on seeing the Elgin pelicans. So I'll read those two first, just you know, because I'm trying to sell the book, <laughs> and then I'll figure out what I'm doing after that. Bisonetsa, gamer, tugia prusa. Я спіси крабле прочов до середині, сі длинний вівдок, сі поїзд журавліни, що над гладію, коли ти поднес я, як журавліни клін в чужі рубежі, на голова царєї божественна пена. Куда плывете ви? Якщо б не Єлену, що троє вам одне, якщо мужі, і морля, і гамер, все двіжеться любов'ю. Кого же слушает мне? А вот гомер молчит, И море черное битиство шумит И с тяжким грохотом подходит к изголовью. <coughs> Insomnia, Homer, sails drawn tight. I stopped halfway through the catalog of ships That long begat, 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 that crane-like train that sometime took to the Hellenic skies, the spumescent brows of wayward lords, a crane-like skein for hostile shores. Where are you headed? 
If not for Helen, what's Troy long you bent to Cain's? Love is Homer's and the sea's and Cetera's true theme. But Homer now refuses. Who will speak to me? And the white waves of the sea blown black muster their heavy oratory thunder against my dreams. Um, and for the next poem, I'll just say that the Elgin Pelicans are the, um, the street sweepers that you see on the streets that are made in Elgin, Illinois. And you see painted like pelican on them. <clears throat> Seeing the Elgin Pelicans on their ungodly wings, with their well-oiled hearts humming, their guts churning fish bones, sulfur oxide, cigarette butts, their golden heads stained gray by clouds, flying low over Hellas and Chicago toward these harbor islands. I race the dawn's gradual reversal of grief before the day's blue maintenance, pitch black, hazel, lavender. Life is hard, loud labor. Even the made bodies of machines long to die, crumple to their knees in the selfless fairy of dreams. Um, so my son uh, just turned 11 last month and graduated from elementary school. But when, um, when Masha got pregnant, I started writing poems, sonnets for him. And I kept it up until he was about a year old. Um, and the first one became a set of poems that lasted longer than that, which I call China bus poems. But whenever we'd take the bus from Boston to New York and back, which a lot of times was like to go to the Russian consulate to get his uh, Russian citizenship. Uh, my wife was, she's Russian and we met in Russia and married there. Um, I kept them writing those China bus poems too. Um, and I still do that. So I'll read that, that first poem, uh, sonnet after 16 weeks. A wet day on a bus from New York back home to Boston. I feel like some old God broadcasting the rain. My mother told me I would graduate someday, seed from stone and limb from seed. I would twist my thumb into the earth and a mountain would spring up at my feet. Maria, already showing in the next seats, peeling a thin skin tangerine, as big as this. The eyes are still wide set. The ears climbed up the neck like monkeys of a tree. And when she's finished what she's saying, holds out a sticky, sweet-smelling handful of seeds, like some new god confiding the rain. Um, and this is a poem. My brother got me tickets for my birthday to um, go see him in Brooklyn, and we went to um, a football game. And I had, for a long time, wanted to write a football poem almost my whole life. I was inspired by James Wright, the, the Autumn Begins in Martinsbury, Ohio. And um, it's something that almost can't be done, so it was a challenge, and I failed many times, but I was finally able to do something that wasn't quite a football poem, but was quite something that I could live with, I think. Um, but I had to get up work really late at night at 10 Bar and take the train to New York and like, get up the next day to go see the game. It's called The Heroes Walk Themselves Off the Field. 10.30p from South Station after work. Half-blood bedbugs on the China bus. I get in before the bar on Bowery closed down. A beer and a bourbon. All night stand for smokes and gum. Catch an F, a Q. A beer and a shot in Brooklyn. Then I get my brother on the phone. A wandering prospect park with the lame strut of a bulldog or a cock in the pasture Sunday morning. <clears throat> Amen for being born, for scratch, for Jets Broncos tickets, a day game. Amen. Oh, and I should apologize that just because it sounds better, they're Jets Broncos tickets, but the, the Jets were home, so it should be the other way. <laughs>
It's like in, um, in the Billy Joel song where he says the tonic and gin. I kind of <laughs> took a little bit of license. Um, read a couple poems that I wrote for my father. He worked for the Santa Fe Railroad and it moved us around a lot. And even when it didn't move us around, he was always all over the West. So Nebraska, Montana, California, Kansas, Oklahoma. We only ever saw him, you know, a couple of days a month for most of our childhood. Um, but he was in Nebraska doing a job when I was a grown man, like a few years ago. Um, so this is that. My father, slowly beaten down by rain and wind, saw a beaver yesterday dive into the plat, walking down by the water with his phone near an old switchyard with a rusted vein. He called to say hi and where he was at. Um, so then, uh, 5 a.m., my father on the front steps, nursing a camel to the bone, quietly waking his five wits. He leaves the house alone before the last cherry in the morning sky is crushed out in Apollo's thigh. That ancient routine, so like my own, I must be in his debt still after 20 years, and yet, what can I know of this soft-spoken, fleet-footed man who barely left a shadow? Will I, so busy with so little done, make any more impression? Um, it's a poem about milkweed. Mealy arabesque sleet captured the thousand speeds in a single ray of light that pressed down on my retinous throat with its discolored heel. At first I mistook for a milkweed husk, a mouse that failed to make the morning, curled up on the sidewalk, half covered in a wet jacket of first snow. When the sky withdrew, they lay there in the thousands wounded on the hill eviscerated floss informing the wind, weightless, unwet, climbing the blue as high as they could get. Um, I'll, read, <clears throat> I'll read a couple of love poems that I wrote for Masha. Uh, my neck, my heart, my haunches, I'm almost certain I was built to drag dead geese from the marsh grasses. But here I am in what passes for a man's body, living no more than an animal existence, until I see far out past the fog and phragmites and the formless frenzy of biting flies harassing the brackish waters, another creature, twice as beautiful as me. And I know she knows my name and gives me the pleasure sometimes of taking what little I have to give away. Um, and I'm going to sort of repeat myself. This next poem isn't that different. No, it is. It's different. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of the same idea, I guess, though. You blessed me like the superliminal logic of a smoke tree in bloom. Color no animal in nature can imitate unless it's that first hour of the dawn as it sets upon a cloud. You lay down with me with the scent on your lips, part my own. No telling what it would give you if I had anything other than my body. Uh, defeat. Maria is my shield, telling my stories for me. I rest her on my back to sleep. She's so sweet, and when she's gone, my defense against predators is to make my body poisonous meat. I am, you are, the world is, too much conjugably withholding. Oh, and then, I didn't do this quite right, because you guys don't know me, and I forgot about that. We just, um, it's going to sound sad, but we just broke up. 
uh, at the beginning of this year. So we, we got divorced. So she's my, my ex-wife now. And um, I was in Venice um, with a couple writers with Mitch in January. Uh, we were going to visit the grave of Joseph Brodsky. And um, when I left Venice, I called back home just to ask how sh she was. And she um, said she was leaving. So you need to know that for this poem. And then also what a kopeck is, which is uh, a kopeck is to the ruble, like what a penny is to the Russian dollar. So it's 100 kopecks to a ruble. Um, I think right now a ruble, like it's like 64 rubles to a dollar, which is really bad. It's, it lost like half its value like almost overnight a few years ago. Um, but on the, on the tail side of the kopeck is um, St. George and the Serpent. Um, and St. George is the, the patron saint of all the Russias, and it's called a kopeck, a kapieka, just, that just means a little spear for the spear. This poem is called Kopeck. <clears throat> the new morning routine is to slay the dragon and drop my guard. Draw a mist you could almost PLP against, stand under the scolding water, and nurse my wounds in the so-called house of Propertius. Pastist scavo, jealously preserved in the lowest denomination. Um, and I'll end with this one. So while I was in Venice, um, I got Marco Polo's Travels, and I've been reading that right now. So I kind of borrowed the conceit and like some of the things he says about the different peoples of the East. Um, we had a sort of salamander industry, but no beast can live in fire. I should tell you, the people of Gorky have a particular custom, and I'll describe it to you. Whenever a woman's husband leaves on a journey of more than 20 days, she takes a new husband as soon as he sets off, and the men, wherever they go, take new wives as well. I was only gone 10 days. <laughs> thank you, thank you all very much. Um, thank you, Martin, for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. It's uh, wonderful to be here in Wellfleet. Uh, I'm really grateful to Martin and to uh, Gabrielle for putting this all together, and for friends and poets in the room, and to be here with James, who truly is just one of the great uh, young luminaries of our time. Um, I was like, James, you're not going to bring any books up to read? And he says, why? Then I'd have to look through the book to find the poem. <laughs> and I like how you say you read poems, James. You don't read the poems. You inhabit the poems. And he always has, so he's um, truly, truly one of the great, great poets. And it's cool to have um, here at the library so much activity. I spent a lot of good times on the Cape. My uncle lives in um, kind of Centerville area, and I used, my first job was washing windows down the Cape, so I spent a lot of time out this way. And um, it's cool to be here on a literary venture. Um, if you're interested in abortion politics, Shoshana Elric is a friend of mine. I teach up at UMass Boston, and she's reading from her new book, and I highly recommend attending the event because she's a real brilliant um, scholar, writer, organizer. And I worked with her husband on some education projects, and they're just very good people, so it's very cool. I thought about reading a poem for the Cape to begin, and I was thinking of all the great writers who have been here, Williams and you know Mary Oliver and Mailer and I guess Vonnegut lived on Falmouth. But I like the poet Alan Dugan, who lived in Truro. And this is a poem from uh, Poems 4 that I just saw over at um, Tim's in P-Town. It's called On Looking for Models. The trees in time have something else to do besides their treeing. What is it? I'm a starving to death man myself and thirsty, thirsty by their fountains, but I cannot drink their mud and sunlight to be whole. I do not understand these presences that drink for months in the dirt, eat light, and then fast dry in the cold. They stand it out somehow, and how, the botanist will tell me. It is the something else that bothers me, so I often go back to the forests.
This is from my uh, new book called City of Water. And um, like James's Chinatown poems, I wrote a lot of the poems on the bus living in uh, Chelsea, right north of Boston. And there's a bus that goes across the Tobin Bridge every day to Haymarket Square. And it is one of the kind of most like painful, difficult commutes like one can do. If you drive from the North Shore into Boston, the traffic is horrific. And the bus is a very, it's a working class community in Chelsea. So a lot of people go to their jobs in the morning and you're just stuck on the bus. And so I was sort of trying to think about how you transform your life on the, um, through the bus. So I wrote all the poems kind of through here. Leaving, and it starts with a grand mash, a line from Wounded Bird from the Songs for Beginners. And in the end, remember, it's with you you have to live. Pack up all of yourself, mountains call from the bridge, the canyon of the mystic, snow sideways from the monument. I scrub myself off the floors, find blood in the drain again. Everyone in Texas is calling me, voices telling me about love and recovery, forgotten reminders. Can I listen to something I didn't imagine? Find a higher power in the bus seat next to me? I burn the toast each morning, open the windows to watch the snow swirl take the road rut through Everett gas fields, hold on to the broken routine, if I can believe it. I started writing these poems the day um, the president got inaugurated on the 120, was it 17? And I started kind of writing the poems there. And it was sort of about political stuff and personal heartbreak and all these things. And so in the book, um, I sent the book to the poet David Ferry, who's this great poet. He's 95 years old. He's still writing and reading and <coughs> calling me on the phone. And he's a very active literary person. And he called me up one day and I sent him the manuscript. He can only read it in MS Word. And I deleted this line from the book because it has the F word in it. And I didn't use the F word anywhere in the book. So I was like, well, why would I use that? And David calls me and he goes, Mitch, you have a wonderful line. It's the best. It's the best 17th century line I've ever heard. I broke my own heart for the fuck of it. <laughs> and he loved it. So now I have to read the poem with the line in it because David loves it so much. So I'll read it. It's not in the book. I'll write it in it if you want. Like, I'll be happy to. <laughs> A thousand ways to say goodbye. I broke my own heart for the fuck of it. Blood leaves the body and dissolves into a different kind of atmosphere. Air and street, Doritos bag. A long way back, holding hands under the arbors of May. On the meridian behind the rotting Shakespeare tree, fooling around in a rich man's garden. Orbison launched four octaves to find a pearl for Leah from the hut to the boat, to the sea. A dream, just another dream. Rain washes salt off my boots and I put myself back in my own skin. Feel the smoke rise out of my lungs, citadel of trachea, elevator to the gallows of breath and angst. At my desk, on the beach, at the river walk, I howl each day, pump my fists into silent air. Remember what it feels to be lit, a burning corona around someone else's sun. Chemtrails cut the empty April sky, wind on the harbor sinks back to the islands. I rattle the ancient motor with my hands, pray for barnacle horsepower to take me under a while, some unknown part of the sea. New moon in Taurus, something about the dark side, the dog, waits in the ante room, unsure if he wants chicken or more attention. Everyone is stuck between something and somewhere else. The people we thought we'd be, the people we can still become, the people we pretend we aren't. But here we are in our faded rain jackets and old beards, a symptom of the seasons or a trick against the light. And I'll read a bit from the long poem, The City of Waters. I imagine the book originally as like a scroll, and I'm going to say a very millennial thing, but I wrote the whole book on my phone, which is really <laughs> embarrassing. 
but when you're trapped on the bus in the side seat, there's really nothing you can do. So we have these devices, so let's use them for poetry. City of Water. And I'll just read around. It's kind of got all these sections in it. The morning bus pulls up an insect. I bored into its jaws, bound backwards towards the city. Bridge shadow over the river. Cars on the freeway echolocate from sealed bubbles. Spring arrives at the power plant. School buses empty out of the stockyard. Rainfall, two weeks now, harbor fog, boat chains, pylons, a sea lion barks out of season. The floods return tomorrow, and I'm still late for work. At the honeydew in Lynn, I melt my mask, eat alone in Antonio, study the universal pawn symbol, snort my own mucus back in, eat the black pills to save my life. Late winter beach light, the anonymity of coats, siblings, surf, and neoprene. Bus over the bridge, Narcan, menthols, iced coffee. Can spring be more resplendent? Wall of Forsythia, dogwoods weeping, a barrier from the world. The eclipse bored a hole through me. Three times I saw the sun circle the moon before I got off the floor. All day, I crawl around in this skin husk, hang nothing from my walls. I'm bare bulb, cold water, chew my fists, eat my heart, wonder how to chum myself out into depthless sea, cry softly, lonely one. Roy sings over the bridge as car exhaust drips down to the mystic. I drift out the windows and back in again fall asleep sitting up. It's like losing an echo, rust out on the pier, a time apart from sun and day life. I wrote five prayers across a nickel, spit them out into foam. Phantoms rise above the bridge as bodies fall through the awning of a cafe. Two energies in opposition, life force and death force rising and falling, yin gone, the heavy yang sinks towards dead weight. The sky snaps open above a wire. I lie in the bower of the graveyard with my shirt off. Poplar and tombstones, elegies to all who are past but linger. Mothers and founders and children missing and gone. A primeval sound of longing. Riding backwards through the tunnel, your ghost in the passenger seat. All the sand between us, a swatch of cloud above the folding ocean. I wait for the mountain to move, the repeated days of standing fall into spinning mirrors. A line of light runs through your silhouette, two hands joined in friction or pressed to a higher spiritual order. How many lanes run across the mystic? I dream of revolving staircases. Sand through the fingers, we stare at the same ocean, skip messages across the water. To be understood seems a curse unsolvable. Expectations crash down like a geodesic collapse. This weight we carry, the bus that won't come, my ceaseless scroll of defeats. And it has a coda, coda, city of water, which threatens us. Three doors to dream through, each a path to the familiar. Sun's winter arc, halfway through, errant wipers, sputtering wet salt. No city except people, Sumner, Tobin, Zakem, broken Zeus, hunched over the mailbox, cigarillos and coffee in the short circuit of early morning. Cold air seeps through the door, Jung's shadow chasing me. The intangible conflict that makes war real. And I wanted to pause for a minute and bring another voice into the room. I work at the Joyner Institute in Boston, which is a institute that studies war and social consequences. And we've been running a writer's workshop for many years. And an affiliate of the Joyner Institute, George Kovach, is a Vietnam veteran. And he edits this magazine called Consequence Magazine. It's a literary journal um, exploring the literary culture 
responding to war, and it's about war and conflict. And I edit for the magazine, and this past issue was dedicated to 100 pages of Iraqi writing and translation. And so a great poet named Brian Turner, who's teaching up the road at the Fine Arts Work Center, he's an Iraq war veteran, really one of the most magnanimous men, and just poets, people, just a great, great person. And so he edited about 50 pages of Iraqi and Kurdish poetry in translation. So I'd like to read two, one or two poems from Iraq, just to give a, another voice in the room here. I'll read this by um, uh, Muntur Abdul Khur, who is a um, Basra poet from the southern part of the state. And it's translated by Sadek Mohammed, who is a teacher at the university, one of the affiliates of the University of Baghdad. And I know Thomas traveled to Iraq, so he might know more than I. We are not dead for Kadim Khatan, translated by Sadek Mohammed. To no avail is this cooing. Our delights are cellars and our time is ash. Every sunset we go to the river, carrying the coffins of our days, polishing our teardrops and shrouding anxiety. We are not dead. For us, only weeping, with which we prolong our embrace with sacrifices and bind the features together. We bandage our calendars, our disappointments, in the balconies of our beloved women, and under a spider's pavilion, we have the right to embrace and conquer cities with kisses. We return to our sanitariums, illuminating regret and reciting elegies. Our lifetimes are paper boats pushed to the waves by the hand of a trifling child, and fold after fold, the sea takes our dreams and unfurls them with whimper. Our lifetimes are withered leaves that have raided the sun with ruins and retired. They ignite defeat and patch up our names that have been embroidered by splinters. And this is for sale over there. If you want a copy or you want to become a subscriber, I recommend everyone to read the mag. We've done, the last issue was an issue of women in war, and it was all female writers um, writing about the experience of war, either as veterans, as citizens, journalists, soldiers. And I'll read one last poem. This is after Fanny Howe's book called um, Through the Needle's Eye, Passing Through Youth, about the Boston Marathon bomber and about St. Francis. It's a book about mercy. And the poem Bear Life comes from the Italian theorist uh, Giorgio Agamben and his theory of um, a stateless soldier who is stripped of citizenship and lives sort of stuck in his own country. I open myself to surveillance, like Francis standing at the wood line without clothes, the villagers embarrassed for the marks and scars they gave him. At the edge of the meadow, a procession, robed and wreathed barefoot mendicants, hair of laurels, a single tambourine, Voices carry above branchless trees, a fecund hope grown in northeast gardens, uninterrupted bird song, a prayer wall for lost causes. Someone scrawled a name so small we thought it an accident. Did prayer stop the wall, the killing, the heart from falling through the floor? I tie myself to a lamppost at the bus stop so I don't sink through the street into the river. My heart beats, unsure of its own path forward, a wire errantly crossed, to save or be saved on the 751. Tomorrow, the sun will disappear, and the light through the window will be flat and empty, depthless. I stand in silence, unsure we're living and lying begins or ends. Which persona will I wear today? Whose clothes will I put on? This energy of bells ringing across the eaves and gutters asks, who is our warlord of night? When will we go to battle? Courtrooms are instruments of imbalance. Who has trust in a system that defies them? Survival isn't happiness. Bare life is enough, say adjudicators of the state. 
All is fair beneath wig and robe, unless you're naked and your head is shorn. Thank you all. Thank Gabrielle for um, introducing us and for all the work she's done to make this happen. And I also want to thank James and Mitch for reading their poems. It's such a pleasure to hear them, to get to hear them, not just read them on the page, although they're fully alive on the page. In fact, they're stepping off the page when you read them to yourself. And thanks to all of you for coming tonight, for your care for poetry and attending live readings. It's a pleasure to read for you. <coughs> see if I can see the page and you at the same time. That's, this is a new trick, right? Perfect match. Me, dry point lover. Your brush, loaded with color. Me, rustic plodding through mud from cattail to cane break, hay foot, straw foot, hay foot, straw willing and able. And you, my vixen, you pour through grassland like whiskey over ice, cool but kind, kind but not nice. A real dame raised you to be neither grateful nor ungrateful, giddy, brilliant, safe as a flame in a stable. <laughs> If you come to yourself someday in a dark wood, you might discover that the words and images of a poem have become a trail of pebbles or breadcrumbs leading back or maybe leading forward to a place called home, a place you've known or only dreamed. Sometimes it seems Edna O'Brien was right when she wrote, many and terrible are the roads to home. And sometimes there's a sense of self-knowledge, of homecoming, of coming into one's own. Either way, that's the journey we're on. And this is a fistful of breadcrumbs. You, you guessed the poem already, Gretel and Hensel. Gretel pressing her lip to the threaded lip of the rim. This is her first sip of the witch's nightcap, jar of milk teeth steeped in moonlight on the sill. Salty, spawn thick, Gretel winces, swallows, swills. She turns luminous as a girl in Balthus, lounges about the house in Baptiste undress. And the beast, Hensel, he kneels before her with a peeled green stick and stirs the ashes, pokes the coals. He knows, she knows, he knows. <clears throat> her mind is an ice storm. Overnight, the landscape has been dipped in mercury. First pulse of sunlight sets everything ticking. Christmas is over. The floor crackles with needles. Under her nails, oxblood and stove black. Her life is running on rails. She fits her back perfectly flat to the mattress, and still every red blood cell flocks off to gape over the edge at the narrow end of the wedge. She keeps rewinding, rewriting her life, checking the doors in her head, palm to the thick oak slab, plump spider fingertips inch back over the wood grain web, wanting a throb, a vibration, the crash of an ax ending her sentence. But there's only the dark dripping from the beak of the strangled gamecock hung upside down with a pine cone and the clock's looped chain. The cuckoo broods in her gingerbread house and won't come out. What does she do in there all day while her husband's away? Smother her young with her feathers? Shh, there, did you hear? But it's just a valve in a vein and the heart pumping blood through her ears. This is hell, rush of the clock hands brushing off sparks, 
Then the maddeningly even and exact metallic clack of the tweezer beak as it pecks up the seconds. Days, her knitting needles scrape their homespun globe into a human shape. The nights are better. Nights, she turns up all the lights and dances in panties alone to the Beatles. Oh, brother, she thinks, if not for me, staring out the upstairs window at herself, perched in bed on a branch of the holly. Don't you see? I shine. I shine like tinsel, Hensel, on the tree. <coughs> when it's not pure song, pure music that Garcia Lorca called the marrow of forms, what I want from lyric po poetry mostly is drama, not least on the sonic level. Conflicts born with us, we're compounded of spirit and flesh, clay and divine inspiration. Our bodies are built from stardust, which is to say, they're made of time. The mortality of the body is assured. Our hope of heaven rests on air. Soon to disappear, we're made to remember. As terrible as being forgotten is to forget. This poem's called Can't Anyone Untie Us. The title's taken from one of Goya's Los Caprichos. No hay quien nos desate. Can't anyone untie us? Stars and spurs and Spain, and she wants a bed off the floor. I, I want more. High tablelands of wheat, days as gold as grain. Irunia, San Fermin, bullying our way south through the feral heat. More raw dawns her mouth that rained on roof tile red. More sunlight scythed and baled and scratchy stacked in the shed. More thirst, more tempest, more hunger that multiplies the risen loaves of the roadstones by the vanishing points of her eyes. The heart's devastations over an empty chair, worse than the breaking of nations, the torch nailed up by its hair to the acid light that scours the threshing floor of the mind in Goya's black hours where he caught my kind. More brushwork that turns with the swirl of a muleta between the nights when the rats are here, nibbling the foam mattress like cheese and ever clear, keeping the lamps lit with a cool blue flame. What's wrong with a bed on the floor? I write your name in salt and ox blood on the door. And this poem is Boca Negra, Black Mouth. James, you'll know this place in Albuquerque for sure. Um, Boca Negra is a canyon in Petroglyph National Monument, Albuquerque, facing west across the mesa to five volcanic cones. The canyon's surmounted by, I think it's a 17-mile escarpment strewn with basalt boulders that broke away from the flows. Um, on those boulders, the Park Service estimates there are 25,000 petroglyphs. They say the oldest date back 3,000 years. The native tradition thinks it's a few thousand older than that. On one visit with three, three kids who were from three to seven, I guess, um, I encountered just off the path someone's voodoo. It, it was something straight out of Cabeza de Barca, as I've said before. Um, black magic potent enough to render copious ink for this poem. So, Boca Negra. <clears throat> Little lizard, little lizard, with your eyes sewn open and your lips stitched tight. Was it the sun you struck with your tongue and swallowed, or was it the night? Your putty sack got slung down like a truncheon, a blackjack, a sock weighted with pesos to whack the heads off Jimson or bribe the border guard. The ignition coil of your tail twitched and you moved like a lit fuse through these hills, the slow explosions ripped apart. Sun arrow, earth dart, your work was murder, enforcing a no-fly zone. Deep cover black ops master sergeant, unseen, all seeing from your stake out in the schist, under the chips of obsidian, above the pumice, your eye petrified, a drop of fossil water from the Pleistocene. Dead, you commune with these mortal enemies, it is the flies who tithe your measly feast. 
O Boca Negra, O my black tongued bell mouth soldered shut, once your wedge head cut a neat cuneiform you had to erase with your tail. Live wire, whip stalk, swipple, lash of the sandstorm. <clears throat> Quicksilver digit, O oh my morning star, your little mimic hands have traveled far to end up where the hours are sanded down, where the blood pulse trips the sun's hooves over the rooftop of these cratered acres and nothing moves. Little lizard, little lizard with your eyes sewn open and your lips stitched tight, who staked you to your shadow on the sand? What carbon visions dripped to your brain pan as your pupils widened and the light shuddered out? Gorge on your silence, lizard. Be bitter, but be quick about it, since you can't complain. Still with me, lizard? Look, someone scratched the basalt's desert varnish, lined the markings, a map of their passing and yours. An open palm, a spiral, a star. <clears throat> someone gouged the shallow basin, carved to catch the rain that never comes or came too late for you. Your death stains what it touches a pre-Cambrian ochre sunset glow. And now that smutch is on the corn. The mothers gather. The black mouth calls you home. Listen, cicada, flute of the ruins. Shake the beetle's rattle carapace and watch how the clouds come. O oh, little pinstripe lizard, slit from groin to chin, gutted, stuffed with leaves to keep the magic in, did no one teach you shun the sparse snake bush, its green too lush for you? Did no one ever say, that empty sky is the sign of plenty, this is the bowl of the skull, these are the hands that hold the eye of the thistle open and close the doors of the rain? Listen, lizard, there was a woman who appeared when I was dead inside. Her tribe climbed the star-studded cedar ladder of the sky, her hair fanned out against the pillow like the night, her hands cupped water falling through my dreams of dry riverbed and winter kill. Two of a kind, you and I, lizard, we left our skins there. Little lizard, liquid sibyl, tap the bitter quill of forgiveness, bathe with me in this abysmal water, lava, font of the dawn. Little lizard, little lizard with your eyes sewn open and your lips stitched tight, quick, before they drop us down some chimney into hell. What did you see? What did you say? What did you threaten to tell? This next poem has an epigraph by the Italian poet Eugenio Montale. It's taken from a sublime poem um, these lines relate the facts of a road trip. <clears throat> His poem is called Syria. My poem is called The DTs. Here's the epigraph. The car broke down, and an arrow of blood on a boulder pointed the way to Aleppo. <clears throat> the DTs. Global warming? It's the dog days, Eugenio. Ratchet the heat. We've closed down the Colosseum. Can't sell a seat with white cops offing black teens for free in the street. National Pork Board Stuff's House Caucus? Sweet. Play chicken with the Senate, the other white meat, on cruise control. Rock the swamp, swipe right, swipe left, repeat. Jack a Hamilton strap, do two to four. Pay tax on millions? What's the bottom 99% for? Trickle down's pigeon for piss on the poor. Money doesn't talk, it purrs, too small to save, too big to fail. The huckster in chief himself is up for sale, our one and only second chance at the third rail. Perjury trap, witch hunt, our democracy's cursed. What swamp thing starts to life now her waters have burst? Kool-Aid prez, citizens benighted, Robert's rules, you first. Which of us hasn't led a blameless life? We're hacking and fracking and vacking and liking our life on Facebook. We follow on Twitter, we kindle and tinder the wife. I am a saint for sinning, the bishop of hippos wallowing in it, killing the competition, lighting them up with my zippo. 
I find your arrow of blood on a boulder pointing the way to Aleppo. Go, little soul, my body's host and guest. The world is bleeding refugees. The West is stitching Kevlar to its Sunday best. And one more short poem to end with. This is Petra. A while back, I was working in Wadi Musa in, in the ancient Nabataean city of Petra in Jordan, adapting a Balzac story for a feature film. There were Bedouin shepherds who were returning from summer grazeland to their homes among the ruins and excavated caves. Their way of life is dying off, yet they choose to live here and now in a place that was that's saturated with the sense that the carved sandstone facades are turning back into grains of time that you have to tread underfoot, passing through the narrow seat to enter the citadel that lies open to the stars, facing origins, wind-scarred, silent when the wind stops, elemental. This poem is my thanks offering to that place, the spirit of the place, and the poem spoken in the voice of Petra. <clears throat> Petra. My laughter is the crackle of kindling at midnight, the moon, my white goat caught on a thorn. You were a man on his knees peeking through a keyhole when the door is open. Heaven is my tent roof, hung by a rope from the sky. <clears throat> Sleep with me. I am sweet tea. I am these red seeds on a white plate. Don't let your heart be a bird that starves with food in its cage. Thank you.